Good afternoon. My name is David Eastwood, Geotech Engineering and Testing. How are you doing? It's fixing to rain here. Um, today, what we're going to talk about is the uh, percent at fall assignment in geoforensic engineering. Um, I was uh, involved in a project uh, in the, recently that... Uh, well, yeah, we had to assign percent fault. And um, so I just saw put a presentation together to go over how you come up with that approach, an empirical method that based on the data, you can uh, come up with a percent fault. Uh, we got about 160 people, RSVP, a lot of engineers from all over Texas, lots of engineers, a lot of people from like cities, counties, civil engineers, roadway engineers. Um, so if you need to reach me, uh, my email is de at geoteching.com. My number is 713-699-4000. This presentation is going to be on YouTube by next couple of days. So uh, if you miss it, you can watch it on YouTube. You got to go search for geotech engineering and testing on YouTube. Geotech Engineering and Testing is located in Houston. We work all over Texas, Louisiana, New, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. We have been in business for about 37 years. We do geotechnical, environmental materials, and geoforensic engineering. We have a staff of 60 engineers, geologists, technicians. And one thing we have, we have all rigs so we can get on projects quickly. We're a full service company. We have full lab, Drilling Department and Engineering. If you have questions, please click it in on the uh, Q&A uh, section of this presentation. This is a Zoom presentation. They got a Q&A. Uh, introduction, pavement design, field exploration, laboratory testing, results of laboratory testing, summary and conclusions and percent fault assignments. That's kind of like the agenda for the presentation today. Project description is an asphalt road in Texas, in Montgomery County, Texas, and uh, traffic loading, major thoroughfare, and two to four lanes. Length of the road, it's about 10.2 miles. And it's got 29 distress locations. These are some pictures of the project that we took in 2021. You can see a nice asphalt road. Some areas is in two lanes. This is a ditch out there, drainage ditch next to the, um, the road. Asphalt distress, you know, we saw a lot of different types of distress out there on the pavements. Cracking, of course, alligator cracking, block cracks, edge cracks, longitudinal cracks, transverse cracking, potholes, surface deformation, surface defects, bleeding, raveling. And, uh, you know, miscellaneous type distress, water bleeding, and pumping of the soils. These are some uh, fatigue cracking, alligator cracking out there. See more over here. Got like a block cracks, edge cracking, longitudinal cracking, transverse cracking, potholes. If, you know, rotting and you know, deflection, shoving, bleeding, raveling, water pumping, water coming through the asphalt. More fatigue cracking, more fatigue cracking. So they had some deformations on the project. The 
pavement design. This, this, this road was designed based on textile standards. Um, they did borings every thousand feet or more. Textile says if you have uniform soils, you do one boring every half a mile to a mile. If you've got non-uniform soils, every quarter of a mile. Highly variable every thousand feet. But if you got potential for sulfate, you do one boring every 500 feet. Sample of materials to continuously depth of 15 feet. You got to do borings out there to a depth of 15 feet in the areas of high moisture fluctuations. When excavations will exceed this step, sampling should extend uh, to finish subgrade plus two feet additional feet. So if there is cut and fill, you got to go deeper below the cut and fill. So if you're going to cut 20 feet, you cannot do 15 foot borings. You got to do 17 foot borings. So you do borings every 500 foot spacing. And if you have sulfate and two foot below the final depth, actually, I don't agree with that. You really need to go at least 15 foot below the final depth. That was a typical pavement design on this project. Let's see if you can see it. Uh, here we go. This is the pavement design. Oh, here we go. The pavement design here for the project was um, three inches of asphalt, 12 inches of base, crushed limestone or crushed concrete, lime stabilized to a depth of six inches. The, the lime stabilization should be in 6% lime in the subgrade with unconfined compression of 125 PSI on the lime stabilized subgrade. Design lime. After the lime stabilization, the PI of that soil should be less than 15. Design compaction, text out 114, standard proctor. Yeah, I want to talk about what that is. So we went out there, did borings and corings along the project's alignment. Lots of corings and borings. This, this is the coring, trying to see what kind of a thickness of asphalt we got. Yeah, we got asphalt, base, stabilized subgrade, more asphalt. We need a minimum of three inches of asphalt. This is four inches. This is four inches. We did borings for the base, trying to see what kind of a base we have. We have crushed limestone. It's supposed to be 12 inches thick. Then we try to check the subgrade to see what it is. We drill out there, trying to get the subgrade material. We start drilling. And we see, see this dark clay type material. That's supposed to be in lime stabilized. This is a typical soil, natural soil. We extruded on the project. Gumbo clay, highly plastic soils. Laboratory testing, we ran some Atterberg limit test. This test we run, basically we get some soil, you put it in a cup, add water when it becomes liquid, you put it in a cup. Cut a groove through it, turn the handle 20 to 30 times. You get a sample of that, you put it in the oven, you get the wet weight of it. Put it in the oven, dry it up, you get the dry weight of it. And you find out how much water is in the soil for it to behave liquid. Another test we do in the lab is called plastic limit test. In this test, we take a soil sample, roll it in one eighth of an inch, and uh, you want to find out how much moisture is in the soil for it to behave semi-plastic. You get the wet weight, you put it in your oven, dry it up, you get the dry weight. You know how much water is in the soil for it to be high, behave semi-plastic, low moisture. The difference between liquid limit, plastic limit is PI, plasticity index. If your PI is less than 20, is low swell potential between 20 and 30, is moderately expansive between 30 and 40. It's highly expansive, above 40, very high expansive. 
So the soils at this site were very highly expansive. And uh, this is a hand penetrometer and torvey. A couple of tests we do in the laboratory to get the strength of that soil. <clears throat> in a hand penetrometer test, you push that sample testing device, push it into the soil, read, read what kind of strength you have. And then here um, in a torvey, you put the torvey device at the end of the soil sample and share the torsion to see what, what kind of strength it does. Unconfined compression was very important on this project. This is a, a proving ring. This is deflection. You crush the soil, especially lime stabilized subgrade, to see if it's got a um, 125 psi unconfined strength. We had to also check the compaction. That was the natural soils uh, on the compaction. And uh, in a compaction, you give the sample of the soils, you dry it up, chop it to pieces, you add water to it, you compact it. This is textile 114. This is a four inch mold, six inches tall, three layers, 25 blows of 5.5 pound hammer, 12 inches a drop. You compact the soils, 25 blows per lift, three lifts. You can do it with the machine. That was the compaction requirements on this project. And uh, you know the volume, you know the weight of it, and you get a density, you get a proctor on it. So in this case, you got a moisture content of optimal moisture of 11 and maximum dry density of 122. So all the soils on the project should have been compacted 95% of this value, like 115 and 11% moisture. But what we found out that they put too much compactive effort on the project, and actually the project was compacted to textile 114, which is 10 pound hammer, 18 inches a drop, 25 per lift and three lifts. So the degree of compaction is, was high. So if this is textile 114 compaction with your optimal moisture here, this is textile 113. Much higher level of density and lower moisture. So what happens, the higher the degree of compaction of the soil, the higher potential for swelling of the expansive soils. So if you over compact that soil, it's gonna heave up. Laboratory testing with phenol failing, trying to see if there is lime underneath the pavement. We got the samples. We add some phenol failings. The chemical reacts with lime and uh, turns purple. And you can see we find lime in some places. We didn't find much lime in some other places. There was no lime here. No lime there. We we'll also do the depth check to see what the depth of the lime stabilization is. Remember, there should have been six inches of lime stabilization. Density of the asphalt cores. We checked the asphalt to see it was a proper compaction on it, proper specific gravity. This is a test that you measure the density of the asphalt cores. You submerge them in water. You can calculate what the density is. Typical asphalt unit weight is about 145 pounds per cubic foot. Ran specific gravity to check the specific gravity of it. A typical specific gravity of the asphalt is 2.7. Extraction for asphalt cores, you do extraction and gradation. You take the asphalt cores, you break them up. And then you put them in an ignition oven and you burn the asphalt and then you get the aggregate. And then you gradate, run gradation on it. So you run the gradation, the gradation passes. Uh, this is the gradation test for the asphalt again. And the base, base and subgrade gradation. 
This is the base here, base material. We spread them out, this crushed limestone. You put them in a sieves and you shake them and you get a gradation curve like that. You look at it, minus 200. 20% passes number 200. It's mostly aggregate, coarse aggregate and coarse sand. So gradation passes for the base. Sulfate testing, check for sulfate. This is a map of the Texas, all the yellow areas where there's sulfate. So you take a soil sample, you put it in here, you can read what kind of a sulfate amount it's got in there. Yeah, you got soils with pH of greater than 10.5, sulfates greater than 3,000 parts per million, moisture is present, you're gonna get sulfate heave. So in this case, uh, that's pavement starts heaving and cracking whenever you have high levels of sulfate, more than 3,000. These are typical pavements, distress with sulfate heave. Here is sulfate heave. So if you're Sulfate level less than 3,000, you got low swell, low, low risk of swelling because of sulfate. Eve, you can do lime stabilization. Between 3,000 and 5,000 parts per million, you got moderate risk. If you do lime stabilization, you can. Add water must be during the mixing. Melanin and curing amount can be up to 3% optimum, above optimum for compaction. The initial mixing and melanin should be conducted at a moisture three to 5% above the optimum as defined by text dot 113 or 114. In this case, 114. Um, uh, if between 5,000 and 8,000, you got moderately high levels of potential for sulfate heave. You can do steel lime stabilization, but excess water must be added. Mellowing curing can be up to 5% of the optimum. In addition, sufficient mellowing period of six days should be uh, followed prior to final mixing. If the amount of sulfate in the soil is more than 8,000, you got a high risk of sulfate heave. Do not use lime. You have to dig out the sulfate material soils and bring in another fill, uh, another soil to put in there that's got low sulfate content. You cannot lime stabilize. You lime stabilize the new material that you bring in. Laboratory testing, we check the pet asphalt and we check them for density and thickness, asphalt content. In general, the asphalt density is passed. Uh, the gradation for the base passed, gradation for the asphalt passed. The asphalt was not the problem. Okay, somebody says, what's mellowing and curing? When you add the lime to the soil, you let it sit for a while so that the, the lime will break down the clay particles and, and, and make it feel like more like sandy material. This is called curing time and usually it takes about three days. Now, if you've got high levels of sulfate, you may have to go about six days. So that's the mellowing time and curing time. That was the boring log on the side. We have asphalt pavement about three inches, aggregate base 10 to 12 inches, lime stabilized subgrade six to eight inches in some areas, this is boring B1. Then the soil underneath it had PIs of 44, 40, 33. Moisture is 20, 18, 21, 16. Boring B2, we had asphalt pavement, three inches, well, 4.5 inches here. Aggregate 10 to 12 inches below that fat clay. You see a lime stabilized subgrade. 
PIs of 40, 34, 42. Engineering analysis. One of the things we looked at was the PVR, potential vertical rise for the site. The PVR is expressing potential ability of a soil material to shrink and swell at a given density moisture content. How much heave you can get at each location. If you got expansive soils, you're going to have expansive soil swelling. So that's the PVR. This is a map of Houston that shows the PVR. You know, you got parts of uh, Houston can you know move five six inches, like in Pearland, Friendswood, parts of Conroe, parts of Montgomery County, Baytown, five inches, Mo Bellevue, five inches. You go to Katy by one inch or less. Go out there, you know, Fairfield, 1.5 inches. This is a picture for not from this project, from another project, but it's a typical heave that you can get in the soil underneath the pavement. That's the heave. You can the soil is heaving up. Moisture profile, when we apply the moisture, as a function of depth for boring B1, it was very dry. It was below the dry line. I can come up with PVR, textile 114 dry line. So the moistures were very dry. That's boring B2, See the moistures. It's very dry. We also check what's called liquidity index. Liquidity index is calculated as a ratio of difference between natural moisture content Plastic limit and liquid limit. Li is moisture content minus plastic limit divided by liquid limit minus plastic limit. With W is the moisture content plastic limit, liquid limit. A negative Li indicates dry soil. A positive Li means the wet soil. Here's the... Um, Uh, here's the kind of a liquidity index for boring B1. It was all negative. This is zero. This is minus 0.1. The soil was very dry. You know, liquidity index again, boring B2, minus 0.1, very dry. Now, the, the design active zone by the engineer was seven feet. That's not enough. This part of town, you got to lose 15 foot. Depth. The active zone is that the depth of which soil experiences shrink swell. If you have a tree, your active zone is deeper. If you want to look at soils, you got a moisture active zone, movement active zone, and zero movement line. Soils above this line heave up, so below these lines do not heave up because of the because of the surcharge load. So. This is the moisture active zone is always usually e bigger or equal to the movement active zone. The way you hit that active zone is where you have a sand layer. That's your active zone depth. When you hit a rock, two foot below the lowest root fiber. When you change the suction less than 0.025 PF, when the liquidity index becomes vertical, depth of slick insides, depth of historical water table. If you look at this site, we, uh, if you look at the boring logs, one thing I mentioned, I uh, didn't say anything about it. Here's, he says with root fibers to 15 feet. So it shows active zone of about, below, about 15 feet deep. So, because there were root fibers in there. So seven foot active zone is not conservative. Active zone, Houston is about 10 foot, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, about 15 foot. For uniform soils, you use effective plasticity index when you calculate your PVR because they had multiple uh, uh, PV, uh, PIs along the project alignment. You shouldn't be using average PI. You should use individual PIs at each boring location and use effective plasticity index developed by BRAB. That was how you design conventional reinforcement slab by BRAB report. Uh, and uh, you multiply the top five feet by a factor of three, 
the, uh, the from five to ten feet by a factor of two, and uh, from ten to fifteen feet, uh, you by a factor of one, and you get the average of them. Essentially, you get all the PIs, multiply them by these factors, and divide them by thirty, and that's called effective plasticity index. The compaction on this job was specified as Texas 114 standard proctor, not 113 that was used. They used modified proctor, which caused more heave. So one of the things we did was we plotted all this uh, information, put them in the table. The area, one of the areas that had uh, distress, station one plus 50, about 500 foot space distance, was full re depth repair. Dug it out, putting a uh, full depth asphaltic concrete in there. We saw heave in it 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. Boring B1 was done there. Depth of active zone 15 feet. Effective PI that was calculated was 50.2, 50.3. Liquidity index was negative be, be, between two to eight feet. The move, movement was almost three inches. There was three inches of less lime stabilized soil used. Sulfate was 13,899 parts per million. The testing laboratory measured 8,900. The plasticity index on the lime stabilized soils was 30. The unconfined compression was 32. It should have been 125. So error evaluation. Design was six inches of lime stabilized subgrade. We got three inches. Design effective plasticity index was 37. We got 53. That was not acceptable. Sulfate was less than 8,000. Supposed to be in, we measured 13,889 was excessive, way excessive. It shouldn't have not lime stabilized. Lime's content was supposed to be six inches. They used 3.8 inches. Compaction should have been textile 114. They used textile 113. The lime stabilized subgrade PI should have been less than 15. The PI was 30. Unconfined compression was 125 design. It was 30. So the design arrow, company A, which is a civil firm, 30%. Company B, the, the geotechnical firm, was 30%. Contractor, 30%. Testing lab, 10%. So let's go through that. Um, insufficient soil exploration by the engineer. The borings were like 1,000 feet apart. They should have been 500 feet apart. That was a design error. Uh, underestimating active zone, they used the active zone of 7 feet. It should have been 15 feet. Underestimated PVR using average plasticity index. They should have used effective PI. And so the design was 37. They had 50.3. So that was a way excessive. That's a, a design defect. Lack of identifying uh, the sulfate. Uh, the sulfate, they, they came up with 8,900 but actually was tested at 13,000. Compacted soils, they should have compacted to textile 114. They compacted to textile 113. That's construction defect. Insufficient lime content, they used 3.8% lime instead of 6%. Construction defect. Insufficient lime stabilized subgrade by contractor. The lime stabilization thickness, the thickness of the lime stabilized subgrade is three inches less than the, the as built thickness of column 13. That's a construction defect. Ex excessive plasticity index of lime stabilized subgrade by contractor. The PI of lime stabilized subgrade should be less than 15. It was 30. Insufficient unconfined compression strength. It was 32. It should have been 125. The civil engineer on this project sign and seal the drawings with this design. The design was flawed because of the active zone depth, boring spacing, and what we talked about. And laboratory testing, the lab did not do enough tests for the, for the, um, 
for the presence of uh, sulfates. So in this case, we got uh, 30% civil engineer, 30% geotech engineer for design. The construction was 30% contractor and 10% uh, was the testing lab. Here's uh, another section, section 5.75, 500 foot, full depth repair. That means we dug it out and filled it up with asphalt for the full depth. 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, experience heaving. Active zone was 15 feet, effective PI was 30. Depth of liquidity index was negative between three to eight feet. Potential vertical movement was 2.23. The lime stabilization was minus two inches short. Sulfate was 28,578. Should it be 950? It's, we measured, they measured 950, but we measured 28,000. 28, Compaction should have been textile 114. They compacted textile 114, 113, which is a modified proctor, higher degree of compaction. Lime stabilized. Plasticity index was 36. The unconfined compression of lime stabilized soil was 80. It should have been 125 or greater. So when we look at the design in here, lime should have been six inches thick. It was four inches thick. The effective PI was 51. It was 30. That's good. It was less than what the design was. The, the sulfate should have been less than 8,000. It was 28,000. Lime content was six. It was really 5%. And right here, it says five. That's a mistake over there. And then compaction should have been textile 114. They compacted textile 113. The PI of lime stabilized soil should be less than 15. It was 36. Unconfined compression of the lime stabilized soil should have been greater than 125, it was 80. So when we look at this, in sufficient soil investigation, the borings were far apart. That was a design defect. Underestimated active zone was seven feet, should have been 15 feet. Underestimating the PVR, they used average PI of 51 and pavement design effective PI was 30. No design defect because it's actually, the design was conservative. So there was no design problem here. Lack of identifying high, high sulfate. The sulfate was 28,000 and they measured 950. That was a construction defect by the testing laboratory. Overcompacted the soil. The soil should have been compacted. Textile 114. It was compacted to 130. That's a construction defect. Insufficient lime content. The lime should have been five percent. It was uh, it was uh, five percent less than design of uh, six inches. So it should have been six percent, but they use only five percent. Insufficient lime stabilized subgrade thickness. It was two inches less than what the six inches is supposed to be. Excessive plasticity index of the stabilized layer of the line. In this case, the PI should have been less than 50, but it was 36. Insufficient unconfined compression. The PI, the unconfined compression was 80. It should have been 125. Civil engineer developed plans and specifications, seal, seal the wrong design. Therefore, the civil engineer would be responsible for the design error. Laboratory testing didn't do enough testing to come up with the exact uh, sulfate content. So if you go through this, we assign 20% civil engineer, 20% soils engineer, 50% contractor, and 10% testing lab. Summary and conclusion. Based on the results of investigation and laboratory, it is our opinion that the asphalt pavement occurred as a result of improper design and construction with the percentages of at fault were given. 
So one should be able to go through this kind of stuff, get all the data together and come up with percentages. If you got pictures of projects, send it to me. I will appreciate it. Um, program evaluation. Uh, let me know how you like the program. Do you have any questions or what do you think? Um, if you need to reach me, my email is de at geotechng.com, 713-699-4000. This presentation is going to be on YouTube. You got to search for geotech engineering and testing on YouTube. You're going to get your PDH hour for one hour tomorrow. These are some of the presentations that we got coming up. Make sure we are you are on our database so that you get our presentations. Questions? You have any questions? Well, I don't have any questions. So with that, uh, I appreciate y'all's time. I'll see you next time. I got one question here. Excellent topic, choice, and content. Okay. That's good. Thanks. He, somebody liked it. <laughs> uh, that was a lot of work to kind of go through all this and uh, come up with uh, percent fault on these things. All right, guys. Oh, I got one more comments. Well, well presented and documented, but too fast. Why is civil engineer responsible for CIS? Why civil engineers are responsible for the souls engineer had wrong data? Uh, I guess if you take the data and you put it in your drawings and you seal it yourself, you're taking some liability. Next one is, David, you're doing great. I appreciate knowledge and presentation. Thank you. How long sulfate been recognized as a problem? Uh, sulfates has been uh, considered a problem since the two, year 2000 or so. That's when I saw it start seeing some, some documents by Texas a and University on some of the sulfate issues. That's when I saw it. I bet you it's been, you know, a problem for a long time. You know why the contractor used 113 versus 114? Uh, they just used the uh, equipment going back and forth too many times. They overcompacted the soil and nobody picked up on it. Okay, here's a question. All these sometimes the client scopes the engineer a less than appropriate scope. Uh, then do what? Then what to do? It's uh, Doug, you got to really have to uh, fight for your scope. Make sure you got a proper scope on your projects. And if you don't have right scopes, make sure you document it and you put it in the report that you don't have the right scope. But if I'm starting doing projects, you know, I always check for sulfate contents, not necessarily. In, Harris County, but I'm, when I get out of Harris County, I start checking for sulfate uh, project. I just did the project in Fort Bend County, and uh, I checked for sulfate. I didn't see any sulfate there. So, any other question? Any liability ever associated with government? due to design project approval, even if incomplete, incorrect, by design consultants. Well, if the, you know, the government came up with the wrong scope and forced you go through it, they're responsible for some of the defects. And uh, government can be responsible for it too. That's why the way you do it is, uh, you know, you let the consultant come up with the, uh, with the scope and if it's, you know, reasonable, then that's what you go with. But 
don't cut it. I mean, I go through that every day with some of the agencies we got and um, try to uh, do the proper scope. But uh, a lot of times I, they don't want to, and then I document it. It, uh, there's another question here. Is it best to check sulfates if you're working on the structure as well? Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, if you're doing a project out there in Austin and all that, it's good to have uh, in San Antonio check for sulfate. Okay, question here. Any evidence of QC? Checks calculations. I don't know what the question is. Can you uh, expand on that? Um, is textile 114 best for most roadways? Yeah, for typical roadway, textile 114 is just fine. It's 95% standard proctor density. If you're doing a you know airport runway, you do modified proctor, or if you're doing a freeway you may want to do modified proctor. But remember, if your soils are expansive, the more compaction you do, the more it's going to heave. The sulfate content was very high. Was there a heave? Yeah, there was heave on the project. Thank you. We measured the heave in 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 as paving was heaving. Okay, here's a comment. Quality control, usually there is another engineer checking the work submitted. Uh, I'm sure there was quality control in there. They really didn't, they didn't get any percentage of faults. Uh, there's another comment here, lab percent looks small. Well, testing lab is not managing the project. They go out there and test when they tell them to. So in, in general, the labs are not responsible very much for the projects because they're not in any management position. They just tell them to test and they do test. That's all and give the results. Well, thanks for everybody.